In this week's update, the US surge is on in earnest. What a trader needs to do to outperform nearly everyone else. And is gold about to break out? My name's Gary Davis. As always, this is general advice only. And please remember to like and subscribe to the video. All right, let's just uh, start with a market perspective. Um, I, I've been making some pretty emphatic statements um, since the big reversal we had on October 27 about the state of the markets and particularly where US stock prices were probably going. And my approach as always <clears throat> is to observe what the market is doing and respond and, and try not to allow my mind to get cluttered with the personal biases that we all have. And sure, I use a bit of historical trends to help, but basically um, I'm just reading the play with an open mind and that's what I've been doing for decades. Now, as is usual, <laughs> I got a couple of viewers who disagreed with what I had to say last week, and that's fine. Everyone's entitled to that. But I thought I would just address one of them. And I don't mean to, to put this question down or try to win an argument of ideas, but I'm trying to be helpful here with an alternative perspective that I hope this particular person and perhaps others that are thinking the same way can accept. So hopefully take it in spirit in which it's offered. And after, look, after 35 years, I've had so many opportunities to learn from my mistakes, and I've probably made more mistakes than anyone else out there listening, because I've been doing it longer. Um, and that's what I endeavor to, to pass on every Sunday. That's, that's a key reason that I've been doing this now for 16 years. So let's start with that question. And I, I think this, you know, this follows on from last week, and hopefully it's helpful for everybody, um, because perspective is everything. So this was the question. What about if you follow the true economic data and prior history and what has been the outcome of every rate hiking cycle and post first rate cut? Now, that's the full extent of the question. I can only assume that the person posing that didn't agree with me. So here's a perspective that I like to think about. What does true economic data actually mean? I mean, governments all around the world are manipulating the economic data to suit the narrative. So I'm not aware of anything that would you could call true economic data. I mean, there you know, there's things that are included, excluded, um, done over different time periods. It's, I, I just don't know what true economic data means. Secondly, does that infer that if you did know true economic data? that it's going to impact all stocks in the same way. And of course, you know, clearly that's just not true because it impacts some stocks, pardon me, severely, and other, other stocks not at all. So, to, you know, to, to paint the whole market with the same brush is just the wrong approach. So I pose the question, is it possible that you've preformed an idea about what you think the market should be doing because of this true economic data and that that's stopping you from, from having an open view of the opportunities. So hopefully everyone can understand why I'm, why I'm addressing this question because this is just so critical. If you spend your life as an investor with preformed ideas, you cannot see the wood for the trees and you're just going to miss opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. It's just such a critical point. And the final perspective that I'll cover today, but look, there's many others. These are just some of them. Can you be sure that the old relationships will hold? So you've gone back to prior history and said, you know, what's been the outcome of every rate hiking cycle, et cetera. But I can tell you in the last 10 years, so many old relationships no longer apply at all. That, you know, to rely on, on history is just not the way to go. So where is you know, where is all this leading? As always, it's better to play the market as it comes. Keep an open mind, have a plan, seize opportunities, and just do that and get rid of the preconceived ideas. Um, and again, I just pose the question, are you trying to use logic? And this is human nature, so this would be normal. Are you trying to use logic to, to feel like you've got 
an edge on the market that's going to be the most reliable way? And if so, I can tell you it is absolutely not. Using logic is not the most reliable way, and there's a reason for that. And that is that the market price is in the future. Prices are not based on what the market thinks is happening today. So what is a logical conclusion based on today's evidence is not what the market is trying to price in. And that's why using logic and, um, and you know, true economic data is just not going to give you the right answer. Economic data shows what has been, um, and there is always a significant lag between that data and market pricing. So hopefully that helps everybody. So where does success lie? And I've been sort of talking around this, this point. So let's summarize again. The four key steps, get a clear and simple plan that's suitable for you. Understand where high probability growth resides. Develop an entry and management plan that works for you and everybody to a degree is different. So this is why, you know, it's, it's got to be, there are some, there are some standard guidelines, but it's got to be tailor-made. And stay the journey. Don't jump at shadows. You know, long-term successful investing is just that. It's, it's staying with a, um, a fundamentally outstanding company and giving the price cycles time to work their way through. So let's deal with the first one. And I'll, I just want to touch on each of these sequentially over the next couple of weeks. So let's look at the clear and simple plan. Now, obviously, I, I can't go through that in, in this forum. It's just not appropriate, but it's certainly something that we do in the Insiders Club um, and to a lesser degree in portfolio analysts. So the first thing is, is knowing what information is important for you and what isn't. And most of the information out there, which is an absolute mountain, is, is not relevant for your decision making. So knowing the difference is important. Also, knowing what's realistic. You know, I, I help people step through this process and a lot of them don't really know, you know, what, what, are, what reasonable expectations are because they've not had enough experience in the market to know. So you've, you've got to, through one mechanism or another, you've, you've got to find a starting point that's realistic. And as I covered last week, you don't need, uh, you don't need to get massive returns you just need to get you know above average returns and you need to do it consistently over long periods and you create great wealth through doing that so it's not a matter of trying to get spectacular returns and taking a lot of risk the next thing is is knowing what what you particularly need in terms of um, return um, volatility risk you know all those sorts of things the numbers of stocks you want to manage so what return, how many stocks, and just work it down from there. And then, of course, you get down to the next level is well, what is the mix of sectors that is appropriate for what you're trying to achieve, and, and also the volatility profiles. If you're someone that is a bit averse to volatility or excessive volatility, then you've got to stick with larger cap stocks, which tend to be less volatile. But if you're someone who can embrace that sort of higher level of volatility, then you can have part of your portfolio in smaller cap stocks that tend to be more volatile. So again, it's, it's just a matter of identifying what it is that, um, that is appropriate for you. And it's, and I know it's not easy if you've never done this, but I've, you know, I've done this hundreds, if not thousands of times and I do it with my eyes closed. So for me, it's just second nature. Um, but I do acknowledge that for a lot of people, it's not second nature and that you do need some assistance. And then, of course, we get down to identifying uh, the targets. What, what are the sorts of stocks that are going to give you the portfolio composition that is appropriate for you? Now, this is not rocket science. It really isn't. You just need, you need a, a, someone to map out a bit of a pathway and, and perhaps step you, step you through this thought process. So that's the clear and simple plan. Next week, I'm going to touch on high probability uh, growth and, and the basic principles of how you go about finding that. All right, let's get on to American stocks. The S&P was up 0.8% for the week, quite a positive finish. 
and the personal consumption um, data um, confirmed the inflationary trends that are heading to the downside. I don't think there's much doubt about that. Um, and the PCE data is something that the Fed does look very closely at. So you know, the, the Fed is, is seeing these trends and they're, they're pretty clear. Now, the Fed is still being pretty cautious. You know, they're not, uh, they're not taking their, their foot off the gas too much, but it's, it's pretty clear, or I think, where, um, you know, where the next move is. And it's probably going to be a rate cut sometime in the, perhaps towards the middle of 2024. And the other key thing, and this really amazes a lot of people and certainly amazes me, is that these, all these rate rises have failed to kill the economy, failed to kill the US economy. The U.S. economy is still chugging along uh, quite nicely. Now there are some you can always find some data that will that will tell you the opposite, but the balance, the balance of or the weight of evidence is that the economy is still going along okay. Now it could fall into recession next year. <clears throat> That's possible. There are certainly no real signs of that at the moment, and you should be open-minded to that. But at the moment. All we can see is the Fed appears to have pulled off the miracle. Now, as a consequence, um, we've seen small caps have really struggled this year all around the world, Australia, America. Um, it's been a very, very tough year for small caps. But we're now seeing um, IWM, which is the uh, ETF for the Russell 2000. They had a great month in November and has started off uh, December quite strongly uh, as well. So we'll have a look at that chart. We'll also look at the mid caps as well. The US dollar uh, index slipped a bit further, uh, 103.19. The market, of course, is being helped by the 10-year yield, which was sharply down again uh, to 4.2. So we've lost, we've lost 0.8%, which is a lot on the 10-year uh, yield in a very, very short space of time. And that's why stocks are doing well and, and particularly the more aggressive sectors. The VIX was steady at 12.6 and the bond market is still betting a recession in 2024, but not with the same degree of conviction when the spread got up to negative 1%. We're now at 0.35%. So let's go and look at some charts. We'll start with, uh, with IWM. And you can see uh, we had we had a really big bounce. So this this was the bottom in in the U.S. in the main U.S. indices on the 27th of October. Now, despite a huge reversal in um, in uh, the Nasdaq and the S and P, um, the small caps were still you know looking pretty somber. But they took off on very significant volume on the 2nd of November, so a bit of a lag. And then we then had another huge session the, on the 3rd. Bit of a pullback, and then off it went again. And look at the volumes on the up. So the volume's declining on the down, volume's expanding rapidly on the up. And you can see what happened on Friday night. And that significantly outperformed the S&P and the NASDAQ on the session. That's a huge session. If we look at mid-caps, a very similar story. This is the mid cap 400 uh, index as as well. So, real enthusiasm, real buying enthusiasm in the market when you see candles like this and volumes on the rise. And we can even look at stocks like Kathy Woods, um, Arc Funds ETFs. Um, you know that these are really quite speculative, and these got absolutely murdered during. Um, during 2023, you can see, um, or even through 2022 as well, we we're trading up around the mid 60s in February of 2021, and we dropped as low as uh, as 13. Now they've really started to get motoring again now. So this is fintech innovation. Uh, this is the um, this is the flagship fund Arc Innovation. This is technology and robotics, and there's no recommendations here. I'm merely pointing to these to show you the enthusiasm and the higher level of risk-taking sentiment 
that is coming to the U.S. market. You know, that's, that's the point I'm trying to make here. The sentiment ar around the U.S. market has, sh has shifted so abruptly that it's even filtering down now into these parts of the market. And some people are still yabbering about the fact that, oh, yeah, it's just the indices are going up just because of the Magnificent Seven, you know, Apple and, and Microsoft and all those stocks. Well, it's just not true. It's just not factual. They are not leading the market and every, everything else is just spinning its wheels. It's just not. And so this tells you it's a very broad-based shift in sentiment. So let's go and look at the, uh, this is the S&P. Uh, finished the week quite nicely. Um, let's go and look at the, uh, the sector charts. So this is um, semiconductors versus the S&P. Semiconductors having a little bit of a, uh, an underperformance against the S&P, but that's okay. That's, you know, that's absolutely fine. It's the overall trend that, that matters. And um, at this point in time, it's still to the upside. We're just getting a little bit of a correction. NASDAQ versus the S&P. So the S&P picked up and, and a good part of that was the finance sector had a, uh, had a pretty good week. So let's get to that. So this is over the last quarter comparing the sectors. At the top, we've got XLK um, and XLC. So they've been, so it's communication services and technology. So they've been leading the way now for some time. But look at finance. Finance has had, had a huge um, couple of months and particularly the last couple of weeks. So finance in America really rebounding. Consumer discretionary also has uh, has picked up uh, quite significantly, um, and then we've got um, materials as well. So let's just zoom in a little bit tighter on that. Look at the last fortnight, and you can see the outperformers materials have just done fantastically well. Certainly, um, gold has helped uh, in that, but also. Um, uh, copper and um, and some of the other um, areas as well, like steel. Finance has obviously done well. Uh, consumer staples. Uh, the American market never ceases to amaze me. The the strange things that it throws up. So with so much enthusiasm and buying of sec of um, speculative stocks, consumer staples has uh, has a good week. But anyway, while we're here, just look at Australia over the last quarter. Materials, then finance, then healthcare, which has picked up a lot. Healthcare was way down here. So there's been a major recovery in healthcare. And then small caps have also um, started recovering a little bit. So that's the, uh, that's the Aussie market. I just need to cover the currencies as well. So we'll look at um, the US dollar index. Bit of a jump on Thursday, but sold off again on uh, Friday. And there's, there's certainly good strength in the Australian dollar now. The strength in iron ore is helping. And, uh, and of course, other commodities are starting to pick up a little bit. The Australian dollar, <clears throat> just over 66. Um, and it's bounced quite nicely um, by about three and a half cents in the last few weeks. Uh, our index gained 0.4% across the week. Um, I'm unclear as to how our market is going to open or the index is going to open uh, tomorrow because um, it, was, you know, it wasn't your stock standard US um, finish to the week. So um, yeah, not sure about how our market will go. Posing the question, is it time for small caps to start outperforming as they are starting to outperform in the US. You know, will that sentiment come in and, and impact the Australian market? The valuation gap between the, the average value of small caps and the average value of large caps is the highest in a decade. So if ever there was going to be a reversion to the mean, then small caps should be in for a really good period. But look, people have been saying that now for the best part of two years, particularly value fund managers who 
you know, they have a they have a process that they use, and it's and it's about buying high quality, undervalued stocks, and just waiting until the market realizes that they're undervalued and the price goes up. But the trouble is, they've been waiting several years and it hasn't happened, so it doesn't always work. Um, so I wouldn't stampede out there and, and buy uh, a wheelbarrow full of small caps, but certainly if um, you know if, if logic counts for anything, then small caps should be in for for a better period ahead of us. All right, precious metals now. Gold finished at two thousand and seventy two, and I said last week it's time now for the bulls, the gold bulls, to step up, and they did. Certainly, it was a uh, it was a very good week. There was a new all time closing high set, not a not a new all time high because of the price spike that we had, but certainly a new all time closing high. However, when you look at the charts, is it going to advance from here? Are we going to get a breakout and go beyond twenty one hundred and start to trend again? Or is the gold price going to get rejected back from what is a pretty serious overhead resistance level? We'll look at that chart in just a minute. So that's the question. And to be honest, I don't have an opinion. I'm, I'm really neutral um, on that question. Um, and I've been saying now for probably two or three years, I, I don't trust the gold price. And that's why my focus has been on advanced world-class gold developers because you can get you can get uh, upside in the share price because the project gets expanded de-risked whatever and you're not relying on the gold price to do the work for you because i just don't trust it but look, certainly things are looking better if we translate that into australian dollars 3136 which is very profitable territory for australian gold producers now, if we look at GDXJ as a, as a proxy for global producing gold stocks, the momentum's really starting to pick up now, and also the volumes are rising as well. Just get back to that. Okay, so let's look at um, the gold price. We'll start with uh, with the weekly. So we've got. This is basically the fourth attempt to get through this area. So the first one was October 2020. Then we had another crack at it and got rejected in March of 2022. Then there was another little run at it in May of this year. This is the highest close that we've ever had in the gold price. But you can see it's still a fair bit of work to get through this area now the fact that it closed on its highs is encouraging um but we'll just have to wait and see this is such a strong resistance level that one of two things is going to happen we are either going to have enough momentum to break out in which case i think this has been this has been consolidating now since uh, august of 2020 so we're three and a quarter years of consolidation, if this can break out cleanly, then then gold is off to the races, because just technically this is such a massive consolidation. But if it can't, then the disappointment may set in, and we see the gold price perhaps back down here somewhere. Now I'm not making a prediction about either. I, I really seriously do not have an opinion. And to be honest, I don't want to have an opinion. I'm just playing the gold stock sector uh, according to the formula that I use. That's working quite well, I might. So let's look at GDXJ. You can see there's definitely a pickup in volumes. We started on the 3rd of November um, with a great candle, huge increase in volume. Um, and, you know, it. it is a a massive increase in volume because we're, we're talking 16 million shares of GDXJ changed hands. So this is very high volume stuff. We had a pullback then, but now we've seen a much more positive period. 
So there's no question that GDXJ is now responding to uh, to the gold price. So we'll have to wait and see what happens over the next couple of weeks. Other commodities, copper managed to move up 3.82. So did nickel, but nickel, the overall trend is still very much to the downside. Um, West Texas Intermediate Crude um, fell to 74.4, um, and that was largely because OPEC and friends still unable to reach consensus the production cuts. So the oil sector still very geopolitically driven. Just looking at lithium, a bit of a perspective on lithium, um, there's continued weakness um, across the board, so there's no question prices are still heading down. But but really, you don't want to just read the headlines on lithium. You need to read the fine print because this is still a very immature market. It's subject to all sorts of strange well, not strange, but unpredictable and and transient cross currents. And for example, there was a very sharp drop in the last week, and that certainly impacted sentiment. But when you really looked into it, it was a single spot sale, and my understanding is it was based on secondhand information. So who knows whether the information was actually correct or not. And, and when you're in a very negative market, people will want to seize on on, um, on bad news. So I'm still looking over the horizon with respect to lithium. I've just adjusted my weighting in lithium stocks accordingly, but the outlook still looks, um, looks really good. But look, we'll get a better picture when we see PLS Min Resources, IGO, those sorts of stocks report in February because the price of those stocks is a function of the actual contract price that the, these guys are getting. So what is, what is the contract price and what is the profitability? It's not based on you know, some random spot sale. So th I think that will be the test for the market, what these companies, the money that they're actually making. So just try and remember that perspective. Now, when you look at uh, a stock like PLS, for instance, there is, an, and this won't be the only one, but looking at PLS, <laughs> there is the potential for some enormous short squeezes here. All it needs is a trigger. And we could have seen a trigger for PLS start to emerge um, last week. So I'll just, I'll leave it at that, but it's PLS is the most shorted stock on the ASX. At some point, those short sellers have to take themselves out of that market by buying back. And that means that everybody jumps onto the one side of the boat. Everybody's buying. Again, this is not a recommendation to buy PLS, far from it. It's just the reality of the market dynamics. And when a, um, when a quality stock is heavily short sold, a catalyst comes along to, to turn that around, then the short squeeze can be spectacular. There's the spot copper chart. You can see starting to trend up in the last um, three or four weeks, which is certainly good. Bit of a blip in spot nickel, but it's been a very sorry tale for uh, for spot nickel. Now wrapping things up, uh, this is somewhat similar to what I had last week about long term, higher level investing success does not require more risk, contrary to popular thinking and contrary to you know what you would think is is logic. You know it certainly applies if you want to own the index then you want a higher return, you've got to take more risk. But if you are good at stock selection, then you can improve, and, you're, and also entry and exit management, then you can produce a higher level of return and in many cases, actually be taking less risk. So the key points here are avoid impatience. It's just a killer. Give it a chance to play out. If you've got a, if you own a great asset, don't be impatient if it's, if the price isn't doing anything in the next six months, just give it a chance to, to play out. 
And if you look at any of the world's greatest investors, they all had time horizons of five and 10 years. And they did incredibly well and they created enormous amounts of wealth. Long term investing is just not for the impatient. Be highly selective and open minded, highly selective in the stocks, open minded in the way that you see the market and you see perhaps their short term price movement. It might be contrary to what the fundamentals would dictate, but you know, that's the market. And the final point is there is, there is a method. There is a really clear, productive method, but it's not what comes easily. It's not, it's not what comes naturally. It's not the way that we're wired. So you've, you've got to learn this stuff. You, you know, you can't generally bumble through and, uh, and hope it hits you one day because chances are it won't. All right, that's it for this week. Um, portfolio analyst last week, we looked at multiple buying opportunities in uranium, which is obviously pretty exciting sector. So if you'd like to have have a bit of a, uh, a look at that, then there's a free trial in Portfolio Analyst or even better um, membership of the Insiders Club. We also looked at um, stock a stock that I love that's now fulfilling its potential. A good session last week in Portfolio Analyst. That's it for this week. More information on the website. Here's my email address and I'll be back with you next Sunday. Cheers.